the Ott Environmental Learning Campus, OELC, is sort of a neat project. We're talking about the DeFebo family. They got the Leopold Conservation Award in, 19, in 2018. It was the first Pennsylvania person to get this award. The DeFebo family harvest home farms in Bangor, Pennsylvania. Rich DeFebo had an idea a number of years ago. He came to the Martin Jacoby Watershed Association and he said he had an idea. That particular idea sparked a partnership that involved many different organizations and agencies. That led to the Ott Environmental Learning Campus. What is it? Well, basically it's a community partnership. The Bangor Area School District acquired 112 acres from the Ott family. It's being developed right now as a multifaceted educational site. The Bangor Area School District in partnership with the Martin Jacoby Watershed Association, Rich DeFebo and his family have created a 68 acre rotational grazing project. Rich, did you want to jump in for a moment? Yeah, okay. Um, site was what John always explained was going to be a model for rotational grazing. And actually at the time, I really thought for me, it wasn't a model I had experienced. I think it was really a proven thing. But over the last 10 years, I did learn a lot managing the site over the last 10 years. One thing I never experienced before, managing cows out in a grazing setting over the winter months. And uh, one thing we wanted to do was prove that it could be done in the winter time. We did have some hurdles. Um, we did not know how um, how poor the soil was, being that it was a Christmas tree farm for over 40 years, selling the trees off the farm, exporting all the nutrients. It was an open loop system. No nutrients were going back on the farm. Found out that the um, we had to really um, bring nutrients back in onto the farm. And um, the agreement with the school district that we could not use any chemical fertilizer. It had to be all farm with natural fertilizers. It was going to be too costly to bring natural fertilizers into the site, mainly because of transportation reasons. So I felt the best way to get to build up the soils, allow the cows there all winter long, um, bringing hay in from another farm, running the, running the hay through the cattle. What came out the back end was going to build up the fertility of the soil. So we've basically been doing that for now we have the soils to the point where um, it should become a closed loop system now just have so many animals on the farm just have that the um, grasses can support those animals that it will not need to be an open loop system where we're importing nutrients anymore we have 68 yep. acres approximately in rotational grazing that's fenced off we'll show you how that's done we have 44 acres which is wetlands and woodlands which is a fantastic ed educational site for the students and for the community at large. With Upper Mount Bethel Township, we have over two miles of grassy trails going around the pastures into the woodlands around the wetland areas. We did that once again with Upper Mount Bethel Township and Rich has been cutting the grass for 10 years, by the way, for the trail system. We also have an outdoor classroom on site we have parking off of Orchard Road uh, for non-school uh, hours. Uh, you can also park at the Five Points Elementary School. Bangor's five schools are all located within walking distance uh -huh. to this particular site. Rich? One of the, one of the uh, main reasons probably I received the conservation award is probably because of the project up there. We have documentation that we're uh, reducing greenhouse emissions by 92 tons per acre. Now, 92 tons per year on that particular site, site through the grazing operation. Basically, the land is just became a carbon sink. There's so much carbon being built up in the soil, pulling it out of the atmosphere. We're getting the award. Now, we're going to look at that, that award a little bit later on, some more detail. And we're also going to have Rich talk about the carbon nitrogen cycle. That's part of the signage we have up. Here we have a, a print of basically what's going on on the site. 
Uh, the wetlands are labeled W1, W2, W3, and W4. Uh, the trails basically follow the colored outlines. Within that blue figure, that's a rotational grazing area, which he blocks off into a couple acre sites with uh, temporary wires. And he has the animals on site for uh, several days, depending upon how fast they graze it off. And then he moves the animals, so the animals are kept moving, and we do not get bare soil. And this is what excited me about the project. Because he's moving the animals, we don't have soil exposed to the rain and runoff. On this side, it's extremely important because we have the headwaters of three tributaries to the Delaware River. Where you see W1 and W2, those two wetlands drain to the Jacoby Creek. W4 drains to the Allegheny Creek, and W3 drains to the Ohotten Creek. I was hoping to avoid having corn and soybeans planted on this particular site because there's erosion, you end up with fertilizers and things being used for those crops. It was a great idea, Rich had. Okay, basically we had three phases. The first phase, we had to get a source of water for the animals. Richard designed uh, a, a water system where we would use a solar pump. Yeah, we wanted to prove that we could do this off the electric grid, being that it was a model site. Um, obviously, it would have been less expensive for us to just take electric off from the road, but we wanted to prove that it could be done by solar. The system was designed for for um, 65 head of cattle, so it was all calculated out for the amount of water that those 65 head would drink per day, that the, that the solar panel had to be sized for that to supply enough water. And we wanted to prove that cattle could stay up there all winter long, so of course we needed a frost-proof system. So all the water lines had to be below frost level. There was over a mile and a half of water lines dug on the property. You, you um, have the cattle so they don't have to walk for water. There's always water in the paddock that they're in. And the main reason for that, if the cattle have to walk too far for water, you're not gonna get even distribution of the manure. So it's a system that works well. We have a holding tank because obviously you have cloudy days or at nighttime when you still need water and the sun's not shining. So you need a reserve of water. And then when the sun's not shining, it's gravity fed from a holding tank from the highest point on the farm. Go ahead, John. We'll look at that holding tank. It's a 4,000 gallon stainless steel tank. Did you pick that up in Lancaster County, Rich? Um, Bradford County it was. Oh, Bradford County, okay. Yeah. In the first phase, we spent about $36,000, which involved getting the fencing in the property, getting the water lines dug in, having uh, the solar powered pump, the well, and a, a water tank for water storage. It went from about a mile of fencing to almost about a mile and a half of fencing because of the, at first there wasn't gonna be a trail system, but then um, the trail system and uh, to accommodate the cross country team, we had to divide off some other sections, which ends up making a lot more sense. And so it we worked out well for the fence. public. So we have yes. the cross country team running around the rotational grazing fields and the public's able to walk around to the different sites. Uh, the second phase of the project was in finishing the water system. We needed pipes going from the well up to the tank, and then we needed pipes going over to the different paddock areas. So Rich laid that out. That cost us another $17,000. Phase three, we constructed an outdoor classroom and we actually had National Park Service funding, okay? Uh, $20,000 for the outdoor classroom, some signage, and then we partnered with uh, the DNL and the Pennsylvania DCNR for more money for signage. The total expenses, this is a small number. This number is $76,990. But Rich and his family spent 10 years working on that site, and that's not counted. Well, I, what, did I want, what I really want to point out, when we took over this site, there was no grass on the site. 
we did not have a budget to plant grass. And I knew if I would put cattle back on the site, there's a symbiotic relationship between cattle and grass, that you will break the dormancy of the seed bank in the soil grasses and the grasses will come back on their own. Um, being that it was a it was fallow land, this Christmas tree farm uh, was already stopped like 15 years earlier. So the, all the land started to go into recession. It was all in the brush. It was on the start in the trees, which there was um, birch trees and pear trees already grown uh, on the property. Some just uh, came up on their own, but there was no grass. It took about a year with the cattle, managing the cattle to um, get all the grass back. And um, one reason we didn't plant grass, we didn't have the money for it. And the other thing is I, I didn't want to disturb the soil. If I would have tailed the soil and planted grass, we would have lost any carbon that was in the soil. We took soil tests and it was already, um, some of the tests had already 7% organic matter. So we didn't want to till the soil and I wanted to prove that it could be done just with cattle. And um, that did take place. In about a year's time, it was all back in the grasses. Uh, the seed bank came out of dormancy and the grasses all got a started. You had white clovers, had red grass. clovers, and other varieties? Yeah, a lot of diversity. White now, clover, red bring clover. In today which brought in seeds too, correct? Well, the, the hay seed brought in seed, but the interesting part about it, the, the hay that we brought into the site was orchard grass. And you can identify brome grass, rye grass, timothy grass. You don't really see a lot of orchard grass and that's what the mature hay was brought in. And that's an indication of very healthy soil when those other type of grasses come in. Okay. So that's, well, that's quite great. interesting too to see that. Originally, Upper Mount Bethel Township charged us for some fees for permits, $70. They decided after they got involved with the project, they gave us the $70 back. Uh, Rich, through the Department of Ag, had a Pennsylvania Forage and Grasslands grant for $7,600. Yes, and also I had a grant from the De um, Department of Energy for um, the, the solar system. Um, at that particular time, they were giving out grants. Uh, I think they were $12,000 grants. Uh, it cost about $15,000 for the solar panel though. That was really a big help of the Department of Energy. Uh, once again, we did get uh, uh, money from the National Park Service. That was the Lower Delaware River Wild and Scenic Group. Uh, DCNR kicked in for signage. Uh, and then the outdoor classroom, the dis school district had the maintenance crew build it so we only had to pay for materials, $16,500. So that was kind of nice. Uh, the school district made the entrance sign out on Orchard Road, and you can see the uh, Ott Environmental Learning Center, also known as Slater Acres. This is the entrance coming in from the middle school and Five Points Elementary. We did have a problem at first with some four wheelers, so we had to pull it, uh, put some bollards in place to sort of block the lanes, but they needed to be removable to get back and forth with maintenance vehicles for the school district. Two large informational signs, one's off of Orchard Road where we have the public parking lot, and the next one is right there past those bollards by the middle school and Five Points Elementary. When you hit the next slide, you'll see the upper part of the sign showing some of our partners. We have DCNR, uh, that's the Bangor Slater to the left. We have Upper Mount Bethel Township helped us with several things. The DNL helped us with signage, Martin Jacoby Watershed Association, National Park Service with the Arrowhead, r, &R Lawn Service, uh, that's Richard's business he has with his brother Ray. And of course, we'd had the Department of Ag and RCS involved quite extensively. They helped us quite a bit on this project. We'll look at the bottom part of the sign. And that's the trail system you see in the different colors. Uh, you'll see a little uh, yellow rectangle. That's the outdoor classroom. We'll take a look at that in a moment. You can see where Five Points Elementary School is, where the middle school is, and their relationship to the particular site. The high school and uh, is just up the road a little piece. These are the signs we put up. We put up six signs. One of them is on the carbon nit nitrogen cycle, which I'm gonna have Rich talk about in a few minutes. 
This one is what are the characteristics of a wetland? And we have some plants that are found, some creatures that'll be found around wetlands. How are woodla uh, woodlands classified? Uh, we have the white oaks, the red oaks, ash. Unfortunately, the ash is disappearing due to the emerald green borer. Uh, tulip poplar, this is kind of neat. This area is at the end or the terminus of the last glacier 13,000 years ago. So we have all types of stone dropped, sandstones, conglomerates, and red sandstone from north of the Blue Mountain on the other side. Uh, we have a picture of the little gap of excuse me, of the Delaware water gap right up there. And then we see some uh, red sandstone. And this is what the property looked like when they had the tree farm. And uh, this is, the, and then prior to the tree farm, they planted potatoes and other things. This was the Ott family. We had another sign with more information on the history. The most important sign is the next one up. This is about our water supply. We had to dig a well because there was no well on the site. We didn't want to use electric from the grid. So we put a solar solar panel system in. Whenever the sun's shining, it, it pumps the water to the highest point on the farm, which we have a, a 4,000 gallon tank and that's elevated 12 feet off the ground. And so they're constantly topping off that tank. And then from there, it gravity feeds into our to each one of our paddocks, wherever the cows are at that at that particular time. And here's the history of the site. It's kind of neat. That original site was purchased for five thousand dollars. The school district bought it for a little over one million dollars. Now, an interesting side point: the site could have been turned into a housing development. With the school district buying the 112 acres for one million dollars was cheaper to the taxpayers rather than homes going on the site. A lower Mount, upper Mount Bethel Township uh, was gonna put in a stone or a McAdam parking lot. And I would have had to put in a one quarter plus acre stormwater detention pond. And the parking lot, you can just see, we left it as a grassy field. We normally don't get people there during rain and snow events. So the grass isn't enough of a surface, and we didn't have to put in a stormwater detention device. We have the grass maintaining the water. Here's our first view of the outdoor classroom, which is located very close to all the schools. You can see we have a ramp going up there. We did have that stone ramp macadam in case we have any children that need a wheelchair or other assistance to get into the classroom. We have a little desk there for the teacher. And going on to the next slide, here we have some elementary students with their teacher. And we brought a DCNR forester on site to give a talk about the woodlands. Then we're out in the fields talking about trees along. Uh, the lady in the turquoise is Sherry Ace Tobedo with Northampton County Parks. And uh, they're involved with this project also. So it's a neat partnership. Here's what the trails look like. Rich is again, once again mowing the trails. You can see we have a sign over to the right and then the pasture gates. There's a lot of gates at places to move the animals from one pasture to another. Here we have a sign talking about the woodlands. We have a slide talking about the stones that, look, that don't look like they belong there. Going to the next slide, slide eight. We had a formal ribbon cutting ceremony on May 27th of 2014. The ribbon cutters involved the elementary principal, Robert Cartwright from Upper Mount Bethel Township, Betty Lou Kratzer, who was an aunt member of the family that owned this property, she was there, Frank D. Felice, superintendent, and some other dignitaries for our ribbon cutting. Neat thing about this site, Fantastic tree swallows, bluebirds, bear. We even have a bear being seen there occasionally. White tailed deer, turkeys, groundhogs. You'll see that we have our water tower to the upper left. And here we are. There's a deer. And the trails, once again, are just mown grass. And you can see how the grass is normally growing. 
I'm really pleased there is no runoff from this site, none. The wetlands are not being filled in. We're not transporting a big thing, fertilizers or things of that nature. John mentioned about the stone walls that they shouldn't be there. That's the glacier till for when the glacier came through the water gap. And that's basically those stones are what makes our soil fertile up in that area. We don't have limestone soils like in the lower part of the Lehigh Valley. Our fertility comes naturally from the glacier till. Unfortunately, with modern day agriculture, you destroy all the biology that's in the soil and the mycorrhizae and you cannot um, extract the minerals out of those stones and, and, and feed the plants. But in the system that we have, where you're not using any chemical fertilizers and you have the proper bi biology and you're favoring mycorrhizae in the soil, you're, you're extracting minerals out of those stones into the plants and that's what's um, keeping the, the fertility going on the site. Of course, you need manure to keep that biology going to feed the bacteria. The wetlands, once again, that's really important for me. We have a lot of wetland plants, like Jack in the Pulpit. Here you'll see three phases of Jack in the Pulpit on that particular slide. Going on to the next slide, once again, we're looking at the wetlands here, and the important thing of it is, the wetlands are feeding those three tributaries that go to the Delaware, and with the practices Richard has introduced to this site, there is no runoff or not erosion of soil, no leaching of fertilizers or pesticides. So we're really happy with what's going on with this particular site. The wetlands, they're phenomenal. On my parents' farm, my grandfather was actually paid to put drain tile in the wetlands. Luckily, that attitude has changed. Now that was back in the 60s and the 70s. So now we're preserving wetlands and they're fantastic for amphibians, such as salamanders, toads, frogs. The neat thing of it is, a lot of people see staghorn sumac with the red spikes and you can make a tea out of that, but most people say, gee, that's poisonous, right? Well, in Northampton County, we only have a few sites that have poison sumac, which is on the right side there, has the white berries, and there's no teeth on the edges of the leaves, where staghorn has the toothed edges. So it's one of the few sites in Northampton County that have found poison sumac. Tussack sedge, neat wetlands plant. The wetlands are important to me. We have swamp, swamp white oak. We have cattails on this site. And it's neat, the kids can go out and see this. And this gets us to the most important part, where we have the cattle on site, they're grazing, they'll be moved in about a day. Right now you can see the grass is cut relatively short, but the neat thing it is, we have no muddy spaces. Which hay did you drop off in the winter time? Well, we'll, we'll feed about a ton and a half of hay a day. So, so we're being feeding hay for about 100 days in the winter time. So you're you're looking at uh, 150 tons of hay will go through those cows in the winter time, and that's what really made that soil fertile in the last nine years of doing that, bringing all those nutrients in, running it through the cows. Easy to take care of cows on snow when there's a snowpack or and frozen ground. It does become more of a challenge last the last two years when we didn't really have much frost in the ground and last year no snow cover it takes a little bit different type harder management our first seven years we had snowpack you know snow cover the whole time and um it's relatively easy to um take care of cows when it's like that that it's not detrimental to the soil in pennsylvania here though when you have those warm years like we did the last two years it becomes a little bit more of a challenge we did have to develop some sacrifice areas Sacrifice is when you decide that, when you determine that um, you're going to just destroy too many living plants and you got to just set aside so much ground and just put the cows on that particular small acreage and knowing that you may have to seed that site over. But um, I found out as long as you keep rolling out round bills, you're, you're creating an armor. You'll have a layer of bed, bed pack. Instead of a snow pack, you'll have a bed pack of um, hay. 
They can and see the large circles of hay where the bales were broke apart. Usually when it's a large circle of hay, that's actually when there's snow on the ground. When the snow gets too deep, you can't roll the bills out anymore and you just got to set them in place. If ground is not frozen, you're typically, or, or if there's just a little bit of snow, you're rolling the bills out so you're spreading it evenly over all the land. So you'll get an even nutrient disti disti um, distribution. But sometimes, like it did last year and the year before, we had some pretty wet moments in the wintertime that the ground did not freeze up. And then it, it's just going to start to get muddy. But if you can keep rolling out that hay, you can at least protect the soil. You'll have the armor with the layer of mulch laying there. Uh, and I was quite surprised two years ago when I had to have a, what was called a sacrifice area of about an acre. I thought I was going to have to reseed that, but that wasn't the case. Seed came up, germinated on its own. It did come up with some weeds in it where it was a natural protector. The, the cows would not go into those areas where those weeds were. But then after those weeds, they were annual weeds, after they died off, then the cows went back in there to graze it. So it was just a way of nature preventing cattle from going into an area too quickly to give it a chance to hill. When Ragweed. the ragweed okay. oh, cows don't want to go in there. And then it dies off and the grasses come up through it. That's when we grazed it. And, you know, there's, there's, those areas came in great just on their own. Never had to do okay. any feeding. There you have a picture. There's this large stainless steel tank within that structure. It's about 12 feet off the ground. Next slide is a close up of the solar panels for the pump. Uh, this was during the Penn State Extension's uh, Lehigh Valley Open Gate Farm Tour. That's in October, Rich, correct? And we had pumpkins and other things there for people to pick up that Rich and his family sold. And we had hot dogs and hamburgers, excuse me, hamburgers from. Your grass-fed beef, Rich. Yep, 100% grass-fed beef. Actually, I started grazing over 25 years ago, and I basically done grazing just to um, get the soil off of a chemical treadmill. And I felt the best way to get um, to hill the soil was to put cattle back on the land, not knowing that there was going to be a market for grass-fed beef back then. There was it wasn't even known of the health benefits of grass-fed beef. Uh, when you when you feed cattle a 100% diet of grass, there's a, there's a different fat makeup. Um, it's a bit high in, in um, omega-3 fats, beta-carotene, where grain-finished beef is high as omega-6 fats, which they are the bad fats. Obviously, I did it in the beginning to, um, to improve soil conditions, but then I found out there, down the road there was a niche market for grass-fed beef, which um, grass-fed beef grows every year like 25 percent but it's still a small percentage of the market these days compared to conventional beef so we, it was a challenge the last couple of years with um so much beef being imported here from south america south america grass-fed beef they could produce so much easier because um grass grows year round down there so there's a lot more reasonable price so that becomes somewhat okay. of a, so things are really turning around with the pandemic now there's not so much grass-fed beef coming in from south america and it's kind of uh, actually business really picked up in the last month and a half now now do you do your own butchering or do you have a butcher butcher it for you and then you sell it we have to go to a usda facility because we have our beef in stores so everything has to be federally inspected we're going to go to the Febo sign and sub watershed map. You'll see a little ye yellow rectangle right in the center there. That is where the school district property is. You have Jacoby Creek in purple, and that salmon color is the Allegheny Creek. The light blue color is the Ohotten Creek. And we're almost against, but not quite in, the Martins Creek. So it's kind of a neat location that where we can have a positive impact upon three watersheds. One thing about when you're grazing cattle and you have a lot of plant diversity, uh, not only grasses, you have clovers in there. And the clo clovers are a legume crop, which is pulling nitrogen out of the atmosphere and storing it down in the soil. So you're taking nitrogen oxide out of the soil, which is a pollutant when it's in, I mean, you're taking nitrogen oxide out of the, out of the air, 
which is a pollutant when it's in the air, but if you can store it down in the soil, it's beneficial to the plants and you don't have to have a need for using any chemical nitrogen sources. So um, that it compares conventional agriculture to what we're doing, where conventional agriculture, they don't have diversity. They're usually planting a monocrop of corn, which is a heavy feeder of nitrogen. They have to rely on chemical fertilizer or a, or a natural, natural nitrogen source, which typically is not available in our area because there's no livestock around here. So, you know, we're relying on pulling nitrogen out of the atmosphere to feed the microbes in the soil. And then the microbes in the soil extracts the, um, extracts the uh, minerals out of the glacier till that makes up our soils in our area that we don't have to rely on buying a chemical phosphorus source or, or a chemical potash source. We're extracting that out of the stone. The other thing we're doing is um, we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere by not tilling the soil, typically it's being done in a conventional agriculture setting where you, every time you till the soil, you end up oxidizing the soil, causing carbon dioxide and the carbon escapes into the atmosphere, which causes, contributes to global warming. Um, we don't do any tilling um, to keep as much carbon in the soil as possible, which ends up feeding the microbes in the soil. The other thing being that we have it all in pasture versus corn or soybean. Corn and soybean are annual crops that only grow for four months out of the year, so they only have the ability to pull so much carbon out of the, they breathe in carbon and exhale oxygen. They only got four months to do that where you, when you have a pasture and perennial grasses, you got at least 10 months out of the year that the plants are breathing. There is a little bit of a dormant period in the wintertime, especially snow on the ground. So we're pulling so much more carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it in the soil where conventional agriculture with annual crops can't do that. I'm pleased to announce that in 2018, uh, the DeFebo family, through the guidance of Richard, Okdola's son is following in his footsteps. Uh, they received the Leopold Conservation Award. It was presented at the farm show in February of 2018. There you see the family. You see Richard, his wife. Dole is the third one. And his other son. You see a picture of the family farm down below. And they are actually on then we have a nice write-up about what's happening here, why they got the award. And it's just a wonderful experience being a partner with Richard and his family. It was it was nice getting the recognition for that award, but I have to say there's I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of other farmers in Pennsylvania that's doing something similar to what I'm doing. Um, but it was nice to get recognized like that. But it was a great project up here at the school. When you have a lot of partners all working towards the same goal, and it, it was a lot of good partners working at it. And when you go to the last page, I just talk about a little bit about where the award came from, okay? Thank you, John and Rich, that was great. Um, it's a really yeah. amazing project, and you did a great job explaining it, so I just have one extra question to add on. So we're focused with this project on building a community vision of resilience, resilience to hazards, and so I'm wondering if you could just um, share any thoughts that you have about how this project has contributed to the resilience of the surrounding community. Because we have constant ground cover, having three tributaries to the Delaware River on this site, and we're losing no soil, we're adding no fertilizers, no pesticides to the runoff. Those wetland areas act like little sponges. The cattails soak up heavy metals and other things, which we shouldn't have getting there. So right there for having a resilient community, wetlands are extremely important. The loss of no soil from the site is a biggie for me. Uh, Rich can go on about the carbon and the nitrogen cycle. I wanted this to be a model that people can access and see how you can have a farm activity, a school and recreation and conservation blending together in one big picture. So I do see this as a successful model. 
elaborate on the management of nutrients. Um, a, a, a setting like we have up there where you have the cattle on the land versus a confinement operation where most confinement operations are just so large, you're pulling agriculture feed products long distances away, transporting it to a heavy uh, confinement operation, you're feeding the animals, and um, the nutrients, the manure doesn't go back to where the, the feed was growing, typically gets lost into a waterway, either in the Chesapeake Bay or down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico, where this system here is keeping the nutrients right on the land where the cattle are being fed. That's the way it has to be if you're, if you're not gonna, if you don't wanna be dependent on importing chemical fertilizer in. The other aspect is stormwater. All the communities yeah. around here are experiencing flooding, storm water events, and on this particular site. When it rains, the water soaks in the ground here. The, compact, the soil isn't compact from typical industrial agriculture where you get a, 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 a layer that's real compact and the, and the water runs off in. This doesn't happen here. The water all percolates down through the soil. And of course, the, the the nitrates are go right back up the grass plant, so it doesn't leach past the root zone. Uh, but you know, one thing for these systems to work, it takes the whole community. How ch people choose to buy their food is going to be really if these systems can stay in our in our area here. Um, you just can't go be going to the big supermarket and, and be buying conventional food all the time. It's sure it's cheap food, but the long term expense on the environment is is quite large. And uh, when people start to really understand buying food from a system like this, how you can um, make a big difference in the environment and really start to reverse climate change. Okay. Yeah, thank you both again. I don't know if uh, Kate or Rachel have any other questions to add in. Well, I also think another piece of the resilience story is the education that it's providing to the community and to the schools. And I wondered if you had any sense for how um, actively used the site is both by the schools um, and also just by the community in general for like hiking and everything. There's moderate use on the site, both by school and the public. Uh, the school situation has changed uh, since about 2005 with the requirement of testing. Uh, teachers are no longer encouraged to go on field trips, take their kids outside. We still have some teachers doing that. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're in a cycle right now where it's more focused on, I was a math teacher for 35 years. The focus is now more on the test than it is on the student. Great. Okay. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. Okay. Take care. Okay. Goodbye.